So welcome to uh, this breakout session uh, for the Biblical Counseling Seminar 2021. Uh, this session is called Facing Fear in Community. And um, it's actually what we're doing right now because uh, by, by virtue of you coming here uh, to listen and to learn, to engage, to read, to consider, um, you're participating in community as a way of dealing with fear and worry. So um, I really want to take the time to treat this topic with appropriate respect. It's something that we might just take for granted, but the value, the value of community as Christians, the value of the body of Christ, um, when facing fear, when facing worry, when facing trials and problems of all kinds. So let me just pray for God to be with us, and, and we'll get started. Dear Father, gracious Father, we thank you that you have given us grace for each day. You have provided the manna that we need. Lord, and I thank you that part of your sustaining grace is your body, your church, of which Christ is our head. Help us to exist together as a church not to be isolated individuals cut off from one another in fear. Help us to draw together <laughs> under your banner of grace and love to mutually support and care for one another, to remind one another of your love. Be with us in that. Give us courage. Give us strength. Give us peace. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through your Spirit. Amen. So thank you for being here, and um, I wanted to start with the Bonhoeffer quote, because he's uh, one of my favorites. He wrote a little book uh, called Life Together. If any of you have seen that book, I recommend it. Good book on Christian community, just a short read. Um, but this is actually from a sermon uh, that he gave. He said, fear secretly gnaws and eats away at all the, the ties that bind a person to God and others and that is sort of the worst case scenario that is what we don't want to, to allow fear to do if fear is trying to gnaw away the ties that bind us together there must be something about our connection to one another that is vital that is necessary that is a blessing that is good so um, my goals for our session um, and this is going to be an interactive session so sometimes I'll ask things of you. If you feel comfortable speaking up, please do. Um, the microphones will probably pick it up. So if there's something you don't want to be recorded, let me know. We can cut that out. Um, but my goals today are, one, just to establish a biblical basis for living life in Christian community when we face fear, but also just as, a, as an ongoing principle. And um, it's important that we give biblical precedent and reason for that. Um, and we establish that. Number two, we want to identify um, some ways that Christian community is helpful when we're facing fear. So we don't want to just say, in, in a general sense, it's helpful. We want to identify how. How is it helpful? And then three, we want to um, look at a few obstacles to Christian community, a flourishing, vibrant, connected Christian community. Um, and we want to think about how to overcome them. Um, and, and so come together and so draw together and so benefit from the blessing that God has for us through community. So we'll check in at the end and see if we've done those three goals any justice. Um, but uh, I have my thesis. It's just a general statement overall for today is that fear, you can add in worry, anxiety, stress, um, reveals our dependence on one another as members of the body of Christ. So fear shows us that we are not uh, lone ranger Christians, that we look to Christ, yes, ultimately, he is what we need, and we also need him through the body. So that's what we're gonna talk more about in detail. So um, first of all, I just wanna talk about some, some, some reasons why I think we are made to be in community in the body of Christ. We're taught that in the scripture, but how is that the case? Why is that the case? Um, and the first thing I have here is we are community-oriented community beings created in the image 
of a triune God. When you look into the doctrine of the Trinity, it's a rich and beautiful doctrine. It can be a difficult doctrine to grasp, but it really reveals a lot about God, a lot about us. So um, humans are communal by nature, created in the image of a communal God. Uh, this is why we can say God is love, which is a teaching in the Bible. So Chesterton asks this question in his book, The Everlasting Man. It's a great book. He says, if there is a being without beginning, is it existing before all things, was he loving when there was nothing to be loved? If through that unthinkable eternity, he is lonely, what is the meaning of saying he is love? And so Chesterton, he goes on um, to suggest an answer. Uh, he says the answer can be found in, quote, that very balance of beautiful interdependence and intimacy, the very trinity of the divine nature. So the idea is God is love, not just in the sense that he loves himself, but he loves within the trinity. Father loves the Son, Son loves the Spirit, Spirit loves the Father, and it's this everlasting community in the Trinity. And so it is actually meaningful to say God is love. It's not just a platitude. It's actually a statement of reality. Um, Michael Reeves wrote a great book called Delighting in the Trinity, where he talks about how this concept really awakens just a, a new vibrancy to our faith. He says, neither a problem nor a technicality the triune being of God is the vital oxygen of Christian life and joy. So we might think of this um, doctrine as something that's some, it's typical to, to have tr trouble wrestling with it. It's not immediately clear how to conceptualize it, but he's saying it's not really a problem. It's not just a technicality way over here on the periphery of our faith. It's actually the, the, the oxygen that we breathe into our lungs that gives our faith life and joy. And I like, I like that. So I have a few questions for us to discuss here to engage on this. Um, have you ever or do you ever think about the community that exists eternally within the Trinity? We think about God's relationship to us. Have you thought about the community that exists within God himself, the triune Godhead? Ever given that any thought? What is it like? Yes, I never did. thought about it, but it's perfect. <laughs> there's no disagreement. There's no division. There's no conflict. Yes. There's no constraints. There's no... It's perfect. Mm. Um, yeah. There's perfect There's harmony. Unity. Yeah. Yeah, harmony. Mm -hmm. Perfect harmony. There mm -hmm. is there is in a certain sense diversity because the father is not the son, mm -hmm. the son is not the spirit. Mm -hmm. But there's diversity and there's unity. Yeah. So I that's wonderful the way you said it. There's not disagreement. Mm -hmm. There's perfect unity of will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's perfect agreement mm -hmm. about the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The intent. Yes. A purpose. Yes. You know, all those things that you desire to have in a family, a neighborhood, a community, whatever, you know. Yeah. Interesting. It is the perfect example mm -hmm. of a community, isn't mm -hmm. it? It is what we all long for, mm -hmm. but don't enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Even I think that's in our hearts that, you know, we want and Good. try to bring that to fruition in our existence. Good. But we just can't quite get there. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Even in a uh, appreciation of the differences of each of the personalities in the Trinity. Yes. You know, that uh, the Father is not the Spirit, but the Father knows mm. that purpose and what he, his part is in the total. Yes. So. The, the different members of the Trinity sometimes have different roles, don't they? Right, it, right, exactly. Yeah, but they work in cooperation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. with so, one mind. Some, sometimes mm -hmm. that's called the economic Trinity, that, that the different members have different roles. Mm -hmm. But that um, there's never a, a competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's or duplication. Right, yeah. right. It's kind of unimaginable, isn't it? <laughs> Well, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine. Yeah, but yeah. we're trying, aren't we? Yeah. 
express. They don't yeah. work like that. Human right. relationships don't really work no. like that. Your, your relationships don't work like that. There's a distinction. Yeah. For yeah. some life is so discordant. Early, early life is so discordant that just to get to the point where you can recognize the harmony of the Trinity is a tremendous stretch. Mm. Mm. Yes. It is so beyond our experience. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Is that a is it a mystery? A, equally a mystery as we grow in Christ, do we start experiencing more about those relationships and things? Does that unfold to us more, or is it always just this? I have trouble just getting mixed up with the death proceed from the Father and the Son, or death, you know, that's about as far as I can go with it. So, yeah, kind of interesting. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's a good. When we talk about the doctrine, there's a lot you can. Theologians have wrestled with this for centuries, and um, you talk about the the eternal begottenness of the Son, and, and these things can can really baffle our mind. But I like the word mystery. Mystery is really something that should um, elevate us and and draw our eyes upward, and have there's a striving after understanding that's good. So it can be it can be sometimes discouraging when we feel like something is beyond our understanding. But I, I, I think God wants it to have a mystery like a, in a positive sense, a mystique, mm-hmm. where there's kind of a beauty to it that we can't fully wrap our heads around, yeah, but, right, we, right, but right. we long to. So it's kind of like a mystery, um, like a beautiful sunset that um, you, there's something about it that points beyond, um, but it's in a positive sense, it, it's, it, there's a magnetism to it. It's so a, I think, yeah. It's a glimpse. A glimpse, yeah. Yeah, we don't get the whole picture, but we can get glimpses into right. it. And I wonder if sometimes the Spirit doesn't reveal more of it to us mm-hmm. in our hearts. That would be something that the Spirit can, can reveal to us. At least yeah. it's enriching to meditate on yes. the depths of God, you know, I guess. Yes. I think it's reassuring in our faith, you know, that there's an, a, a, a perfect and complete agreeance um, in that that we don't understand but we can trust in it we can trust in him yes we can trust what the word says is true and because if, if there were any kind of conflict or something you'd be like oh that would kind of degradate some of the authenticity and the you know I don't know what I'm trying to get at but yeah there's there's value in not being able to understand it other than what the, I think the Spirit reveal, reveals to us, and uh, as we grow in our in our walk and our in our sanctification, we may have nuances of greater understanding, but not quite getting there, mm-hmm. uh, just because that's something we'd have to understand with a regenerated mind when we're, yeah. you know. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Thank you. Sorry, I don't mean to... No, gas. Yes, that's great. Yeah. great. I think there was a comment here and then one over here. Marie? I think for what makes the Christian life so interesting is that we don't ever quite get it all. Mm-hmm. And as we go through life, there's more being revealed. If we knew it all, it'd get boring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, you know? Yeah, that would be... But yeah. anyway, it's kind of neat as, as we go and as we can bear it sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. revealed. We grow, we, mat- we mature take the next step that's revealed, you know, it makes our life with the Lord yes. healthy and good. And yes. Living. Uh, yes. Absolutely. And I think the Spirit reveals to us, uh, I mean, we shouldn't be alone. We need to be in community. Yes. Yeah. And in community is when we learn the most. I mean, we learn... Okay, let me give you an example. We were on the table, so many examples, but this one, um, just recent, we are in the table a few minutes ago discussing, and then this lady, <clears throat> we always complain about things, something weird. It's all about us and our life and our suffering. Mm-hmm. But then we hear somebody in the community, another person, that has another experience in life, and another one, and another one, and some people really have some terrible things in their life that 
we cannot even imagine. Mm. And then we learn from there, and the Spirit revealed in us more of what really God is, and we stop thinking about our things, our problems. Mm -hmm. It's the amazing beauty yeah. of God mm. and, the, and the Son and the Spirit. Yes. Wonder wonderfully said. Yeah, I think you're really getting to the next thing we want to discuss. You guys are sharp, very sharp. I love the way you said that, Isabella. Uh, the next two questions we'll just spend a minute on together. So how do we reflect the communal nature of God as human beings? We read in Genesis that we're created in the image of God. So that's in the image of the triune God. And then why does God call his children to live life in community? So how do we reflect this communal nature? And why does he call us to live in community? And you started to answer that question already. Uh, anything else you would say about that? <clears throat> we'll be saying a lot about it today. I think my mind got warped uh, by watching that British seg little parody on the therapy session mm -hmm. I keep thinking there would be a great therapy session seeing the try you know the Trinity in therapy and what they had to say to each other I don't know <laughs> I'm having a hard time focusing on anything else right okay. now <laughs> oh that's hilarious <laughs> you just said a little too touchy-feely you know <laughs> Like, well, what are you thinking? You know? Oh, it's too <laughs> the funny. Trick, the Holy Spirit might say, mm. or something, you know, mm -hmm. Jesus might say to the Holy Spirit, did you have to whisper that in his ear? You know? I don't know. It'd be great. <laughs> I'm sorry. Except nope, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> Part of the blessing of community is that we don't always have to worry that whatever we say is going to be just right because um, we have grace for each other so it, yeah, yeah I can imagine watching the Trinity in conversation and just being in awe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also want to take a minute just to welcome the people who are really watching um, we're recording this so if you're watching this later thank you for joining us thank you for watching thank you for thinking about these things with us anything else to say about the way that we reflect the triune nature of God, the communal nature of God, and why God would want us to actually act out on that by living in community. Don't you... Th I, I, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I think Here, when you live in community, you have uh, something on you that everybody is around you, you're willing to help them to make better the relationship or to do something for them. Yes. I think when you live in community, uh, God put this on us that we need to do something when you are in community. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Don't you notice that when you're in community, God uses other people to speak to you and teach you things? Mm -hmm. yes. You see things more clearly. Mm -hmm. I would encourage and to define challenges that you might be facing mm -hmm. uh, in a biblical sense, hopefully. Um, I think of Band of Brothers, you know, a guy, so of course I go there. <clears throat> Band of Brothers, yeah. The, I'm sorry? Yeah, it's a great series. It is. Um, but anytime you're in any kind of uh, uh, an, an, um, challenging environment, to go through it by yourself is pretty hard. Mm -hmm. But when you have somebody alongside you, it's a believer, and we live in a fallen world, and there's just challenges all around. Yes. And um, so not to have community, I think that's one of Satan's greatest tools to yeah, get um, a church to fall or a community to fall is to get them divided amongst themselves mm -hmm. and to separate them out. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then uh, to defeat those people that are not together you know so i think there's protection mm -hmm. uh, i think there's um uh, just a lot of positive things about there's challenges too you know but uh 
yeah, just to strengthen our faith and our walk and our beliefs and our our perspectives, our understanding, all those kind of things. Yes, yeah. yes, I think you're right on track with that. Yeah. Absolutely. I know there's a couple other comments. I'm sorry. Yeah, right here and then. Uh, recently, um, <clears throat> I was exposed to uh, the book, the title, the same kind of different as me, mm. and the one of the characters, Denver Moore. Uh, made a statement that is quite thought-provoking now. We'll never know whose eyes God is watching you out of. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's I mean, rather simplistic, but yet quite uh, quite challenging. Yes, I love that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. There was looking at us through each other's eyes. I love that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Chris. Um, there is a book I was reading part of, it kind of goes with Richard's in a different way, but it was about a um, father and a son who went through concentration camps for five years mm-hmm. and multiple concentration camps, and they, they're they the only two who made it almost from the beginning of concentration camps to the end mm-hmm. and came out the other side. And they believe that they made it through because they had each other. And if one had been lost, the other would have quickly been lost. But they said, what I kept thinking about was I have to keep going for my dad or my son. And they lost all their other family members, which were multiple, but they made it through together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what church is about, is that we make it together. We don't separate out and go our own ways because something messy has happened. Hang in there and learn from what you're hanging in there for. That's a great example. Yeah. Great. I think another thing um, that happens in community is what happens to us as we are being used in another's life. Mm-hmm. The, the idea of being useful in the Lord's hands. Um, that's something we can't experience, I don't think, unless we're relating with one another. Um, I've had moments where I think, this is God, you know, experiencing God through ministering to the community. It's really quite powerful. Yeah. Uh, it can, yeah. can really be life-changing, too, mm-hmm. to, to know that God is here. <laughs> you know, God is actively involved in this body, this community. It's, it's really a wonderful yeah. experience. Thank you for sharing that, Marie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that reminds me of a, a study, an experiment I read about where there were um, people who were diagnosed with MS, multiple, multiple sclerosis, and they did an experiment with, there was a group of people who, um, who had someone encouraging them and, and loving them and spending time with them, right? And just being there with them as a friend. And there was another group who didn't have that. And so part of the experiment was tracking which group, you know, reported sort of better experience. So um, we're not talking about the disease necessarily going away, but better optimism, better hope, right? Better endurance. And the group that had the best um, outcomes on their surveys was actually the, the, the group that was ministering to the first group, which were also, they were also MS sufferers. So it was the group that was actually serving, the group that was actually um, encouraging, the group that was actually giving service. They were the ones that reported the best levels of hope, the best levels of confidence, the best levels of joy. So there's a blessing in being a comfort. There's a blessing in being uh, a friend to another. It's not just receiving that, but it's giving that. that um, we start to see that there's a reasons why God calls us to live in community. It's actually good for us. Mm-hmm. And when we when we recognize that, it's like seeing God has a good purpose for this. Mm-hmm. Um, that if it helps us, God knows that about us. So He's not um, He's not working against us when He tells us to come together. Um, and so I just wanted to review a few uh, passages. We could spend a lot of time, but. Um, just again to establish a foundation of biblical teaching about community and you probably think of other passages but I love Proverbs I love the wisdom literature in the Old Testament 
Uh, Proverbs 17, 17, easy to remember, just the numbers are the same. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. I love that because it really captures just the value of true friendship. That it's, it's not just for the good times. And um, the Proverbs are kind of general principles. You know, they're not, um, they're not like rules you can apply to every situation, but really it's, it's highlighting the blessedness of true friendship, I think, which is what God, God's desire is for us as Christians. And then um, Ecclesiastes, um, Ben taught a class on Ecclesiastes, so most likely Solomon, but the writer, the teacher says, um, it's a famous passage, but um, there's some that precedes it. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So um, this is the passage where two are better than one, and it gives different examples of why that is the case. I use verse 12 because we're talking about fear. So we're talking about uh, one person being overpowered. You could think of them being overpowered by their fear or worry or the dangers of life. And this is saying you there's strength in um, togetherness. The cord of three strands, I did some research on that. Um, some, some commentators said that um, the threefold cord was the strongest cord of the day. So it's just basically saying like, um, if you weave strands together, it's gonna be the strongest you can possibly be. And, and others said it's just kind of like a, it's kind of like a parabolic saying. It's just like an idiom um, that basically there's strength and unity. Uh, but this is from uh, Matthew Henry's commentary. I just gave a quote from him. He says uh, about this passage, in all things, union tends to success and safety, but above all, the union of Christians. They assist each other by encouragement or friendly reproof. They warm each other's hearts while they converse together of the love of Christ or join in singing praises. Then let us improve our opportunities of Christian fellowship where two are closely joined in holy love and fellowship. Christ will by his spirit come to them. Then there is a threefold cord. Mm -hmm. So when we think of even just two believers gathered and then the Christ is there with them in a special way through the spirit that is a strength that is a that is a a perseverance that is there through that and then Jesus and Paul um, I give you here um, what Paul writes to the Corinthian church um, there's a lot of good passages on this but I love this passage um, Paul says if one member suffers all suffer together if one member is honored all rejoice together mm -hmm. And you could, you could put in a lot of different phrases there. If, if, if one is afraid, all come around that person who's afraid. All give courage. Uh, now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a member of it. I like that because it's almost, the implication is, um, you are incomplete without the body, the body is incomplete without you. You are part of the body of Christ. Whether you're actually living that out is another question, but you are part as a Christian. So we are all part of this universal body of Christ, the universal church. And turn the page over. I just want to read a little section of um, Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. This is um, his prayer for uh, first his disciples, uh, but then he shifts to um, pray for all believers, and, and which includes us. So th this is, this should, we should stop and listen because Jesus is actually praying for us here. So Jesus says in John 17, verse 20, I do not ask for these only, his disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be, they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, 
that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. So a few minutes back, we were talking about the Trinity and the sort of love and harmony that exists there. Do you realize that Jesus in this prayer is saying, Father, let that same you unity be in them and, and let that be a glory that points them points the world to you, that when they see the, the unity of the believers, it glorifies us. So I have here in the high priestly prayer, he prays that we will reflect the glory and unity of the triune God. And so we were, we were just wrestling with this a few minutes back, you know, that's so different. Um, the Trinity, how they exist in community is so different from us, isn't it? And yet, um, Jesus is praying that we would be like that, that, that when the world sees us, they would see that reflected, um, that nature of God reflected in us. Powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that like knocked me off my feet. <laughs> so uh, another question here, um, if you have any thoughts, how is the glory of God more perfectly reflected in community than it is in, in individuals? You know, in an individual, the glory of God can be reflected. So I just want to establish that. But how is it more perfectly reflected in a community? And think of Jesus' prayer here. So I think that <clears throat> when two or more are gathered in my name, there am I, then, then you have this blessing of God upon that situation in which God um, lets us know that He, especially, especially in some special way, blessing or there in some special way. Yes. Uh, so the anticipation uh, and the potential, you know, we, if, if we if we know that and we, and we come together in that manner, then maybe we are then maybe more sensitized, sensitive to what's going on and to the, pr the presence of uh, the Lord. That's interesting. That's a really good thought that I agree. God is there in a special way. God is everywhere. We know that his omnipresence he is everywhere, but he is there in a special way when believers are gathered together. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's an increased awareness of that presence or an increased manifestation of that presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a sense where the Lord says, thanks for the, thank you for the water, thank you for the clothing, thank you for this. And when, and as much as you did it to the least, mm -hmm. you did it to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Even in the act of serving others, that is within community. Within, for the glory of God. For the glory of God, yes. Thank you. I, I can't help but think of just the diversity of, of, of a group reflecting God's glory. One person can't reflect all of God's oh, glory. Oh, yeah. Good point. The diversity of it. It's like if you're talking about that sunset, what aspect of the sunset reflects the glory of God? One piece of it or the whole thing? Mm. Is it the reflection of the water? or the colors of the sky or the sun itself maybe the silhouette of a mountain range you know it's like yeah the whole thing does just like you know we can we have access to join in this unity of the trinity through christ and then because of our diversity reflect god's glory in and in, in it all does that make sense yes it does yeah. well and if you even even think about the amount of droplets in the sky that makes the prettier sunsets the many many minis small clouds or whatever you know with the elements that make that beautiful reflection of god's glory mm, yes. and how minute they are but mm. it's all of them together that creates that it's just too big for us to imagine. Yeah, the, the, the totality of it is beautiful. Right. Like when I look out in this room, each one of you reflects the glory of God in, in your own unique way. Right. No one else quite reflects God the way that you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that's really beautiful if you think about it. 
Sweetie, did you have something? I was just thinking about how in community we get the opportunity for us to demonstrate God's love and grace to each other mm -hmm. in kind of like a tangible, earthly way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. You could just sit at home and think really loving thoughts and that would be not as good as actually doing loving things for another person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then someone else might get to benefit from your loving actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's good. Anything? Yeah, I've had experiences where specifically you have, you know, done things for me, like really beautiful, powerful things, and that's brought me closer to God because it's made me realize just how real the things he's done for me mm. are wow, yeah. because I felt it in the way that I experienced it with you. Thanks. Yeah. That same, same, I, I've experienced that same thing. Um, I've experienced the love of God. It was almost like God used someone in the body to show me something that was in a tangible way that it would have been harder for me to, to, to trust and to know without experiencing it mm -hmm. through another person. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good point. I think that's really well said, Richard. I was going to say something similar, that there's such grace in God's gift of relationship, human relationship, mm -hmm. um, because it is so visual and tangible, and someone can actually touch us physically. Mm -hmm. um, which we don't get the physical touch of God, but through them, yeah. um, we are touched. Yeah. Um, and that can be an extension of God's love. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had uh, one of my best friends uh, pass away um, with cancer at a really young age. Mm. And I was thinking about, at his memorial service, how to remember his life and honor him. And uh, your question here is really good. How is the glory of God more perfectly reflected in community than individuals? And uh, I was thinking about his life and uh, at the end of the day, we want our life, if someone reflects on it, to reflect God's glory, to give Him glory. We lived our life in a way that pointed others to Him. Mm. And uh, so what I, what I came up with was, um, He was Jesus to me. That's what I said. Um, his love and His friendship to me was an extension of Christ's love, and it pointed me to Him. Wow. And there's nothing greater that you could ask for um, from a friend. And that is a grace. Um, and, and so God is glorified in his life because he was an extension of his love. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Ben. That's powerful. Don't you think sometimes we, we think it has to be either or, that it's either we're experiencing God or we're experiencing people? That, that example you just gave shows that that's not the case, that it can be both it can be experiencing God through people. You can experience God on your own in solitude, but you can experience God through people. Yeah. It's not a choice between the two. And Jesus said by this, they will know if you're my disciples, if you love one another. Yeah, and that that is a convicting thing to think like the, when the world looks at you, they'll know by how you love each other who you're really worshiping. That's good, thank you. If we can continue this. Was there any other comments? We'll, we'll be continuing the same discussion. Um, so one of the ways it's helpful, and we're already talking about this, so there's overlap. Um, Christian community is beneficial to the believer facing worry and fear. So. Um, this is just a general principle, and then we'll get more specific. So um, Ed Welch, in the book we read, Running Scared, um, he says, uh, no matter how much we rail against our dependency on other people, we really are dependent people with limited control. We have to rely on other people. Like it or not, that's the system. Fear is a door to spiritual reality. It suggests that authentic humanness was never intended to be autonomous and self-reliant. Humans are needy by design. 
I, I don't know about you, but I don't really like feeling needy. <laughs> there's a there's a kind of an American um, virtue of self reliance that yeah, maybe it, it obviously predates America, but yeah. Um, so I think Welch goes on to talk about how we need God. That is our ultimate dependency, um, but we need each other. And again, that's not an either or. Did you have something? No. Okay. Okay, so um, now we're going to get more specific. So how can Christian community be helpful to believers facing fear and anxiety specifically? So believers are worried. Believers are afraid. Believers face anxiety. Right? This is true. We, we, we know this. So how can community be helpful in that kind of a case? You can speak truth to each other. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even maybe truth that is already on some level known and believed, mm. uh, we can speak it out loud yes. to each other, and that's a blessing. Yeah. Right? I think a lot of times when I fear, at least, I've taken my eyes off of God, and community can remind one another. You know, you can refocus, help somebody refocus on God again. Because when you do lift your eyes to God, you realize this is this is nothing compared to God, if you know God, mm -hmm. you know. So I think community is needful sometimes to get us refocused back to the truth. Yes. It's interesting to think about sometimes being the person who needs that mm -hmm. and sometimes being the person who gives it. Yeah. That someone may come to you who's afraid and you get to be that reflector of God. Yeah. That points their eyes upward. And then I'm the one who's afraid, and someone else is <laughs> yeah, for me. That's right. I mean, it's just the community works right. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, left to myself, I can get into a circular pattern that's very unhealthy and not realistic. Mm -hmm. And so I, I started imagining things about the fear that aren't true mm -hmm. and almost get to the point of paranoia. And you're like, wait a minute, where you need to readjust in the military call readjust fire because mm -hmm. you're not you're not on track and this isn't true mm -hmm. and for whatever reason um you know could be the enemy whispering uh you know lies that uh bring in uh, untruth into your thoughts about the fear and it just kind of ex expands and, and grows to a point that it's not it's not not rational. <laughs> yeah, sure. So when you share that with somebody, like, why would you think that's going to happen when, you know, you need to back this up. Okay. This is, you know, this is where you're at, and this is what's happening, not that. You're kind of getting too far down range, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. We can diminish the over, <laughs> overblown fears mm -hmm. by reminding each other of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. And just sharing, oh, I've gone through that. I mm. know how that, I, yeah, I know how you feel. I can, okay, to relate? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can relate. Um, you know, um, it's part of the iron sharpening iron. Yes. Is that That's another one proper. person who's experienced it, and, and it helps that resharpening you, you again. So... Yeah, that proverb, as iron sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. I think of that process not always being pleasant or easy, because you think about the iron grinding against each other, but it is, it is, a, it is a sharpening influence, and we do that for each other. Mm -hmm. But it's not always warm and fuzzy, is I guess what I mean. <laughs> Actually, other, I don't want to cut anyone off. Any sparks fly when sparks. iron is sharpening iron. If <laughs> yeah. you've never seen that, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, um, I think I've seen it in movies. <laughs> <laughs> don't know if we have a local blacksmith in the area. <laughs> okay, well we'll keep we'll keep the discussion going. So, um, yeah, um, we've already talked about this, but community can pr provides wider perspective. Right, cast on the fear and anxiety we face as believers. Mm -hmm. So I have this example from uh, the movie Gods and Generals. Anyone seen that film? No, I want to now, though. <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a film called Gettysburg, 
mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. Based on a novel called The Killer Angels, which was a Pulitzer Prize winning novel. And Gods and Generals is kind of the pre- prequel, but it's just it's a Civil War drama. <laughs> so it's historical, um, you know, some fiction, but it's a historical account. So um, an example of how community provides perspective when fear looms. So during the Battle of Bull Run, uh, the outnumbered Confederate forces um, hear their captain shout, look, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. And that's their general, rallying the soldiers to charge behind General Thomas Jackson. And so he's, in the movie it's really dramatic, he's, he's standing up, everyone else is lying down, <laughs> bullets, right? Jackson, he, he's, he's on a horse, so he's, he's up and he's, he's rallying the charge, he's, he's brave, and everyone's rallying behind him. And um, so after the battle, General Stonewall Jackson, which is the nickname he, he got, um, eventually shares the reason for his courage. And here's what the lines are. Um, General Jackson, um, oh sorry, um, it, it should say uh, Smith, <laughs> not General, so this is Captain Smith. Uh, How is it that you keep so serene and stay so utterly insensible with a storm of shells and bullets raining about your head? And this is Jackson. Captain Smith, my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. God has fixed the time for my death. I do not concern myself with that, but to always be ready, to be always ready, whenever it may overtake me. That's the way all men should live. Then all men would be equally brave. And I thought that was a powerful way. Jackson just is reminding Smith of God's sovereignty. We talked about this in the in the session today. So I, I use that as just, just an illustration of how um, in the battle, the men rallied around this person who was demonstrating leadership, but then after, in this, this intimate conversation, Jackson is able to um, share the reason for his courage with his captain and kind of impart courage through that. Does that make sense or any comments, questions on that? This idea, or have you experienced this personally or have you done this for someone, provided perspective, um, had perspective provided to you uh, in conversation, or uh, by example, I'm sure we all have. Yeah, yeah. Kind of poor, not nearly to that. Uh, I was raised in Africa, and when one year when my parents were on furlough, we found out that my best friend in Nigeria uh, had contracted leprosy. And I remember thinking, as a, in my early teens, thinking, what am I going to do when I see this guy? And my mother was a nurse, and she worked with leprosy patients, so she knew the full scope of that. Anyhow, when I saw the kid, my friend, for the first time when I returned to Africa, we just I just embraced him. My mom was mad at me, hmm. and uh, and my only reason was, well, God is greater than the the chances of getting leprosy. Yeah. <laughs> What a powerful example that was. I, I knew the kid needed that. He, it, it meant more to him yeah. you know, that he would yeah. not be not untouchable. Mm-hmm. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, after I lost my mom, uh, I was a teenager and she died of kidney cancer. It was a struggle over years, but. Um, we had some really good time together before she passed, and um, her testimonies were really powerful to our church and the people who knew her. But um, afterwards, someone, a, a pastor, was talking with me and didn't know the situation, and I told them, you know, my mom is is gone. She's with the Lord, and and she, you know, she was ravaged by cancer. Her body, the, the radiation and the cancer mm-hmm. itself, really um, tore her body apart. Mm-hmm. And he very lovingly just looked at me in the eyes and said something like, she doesn't have the cancer anymore. Mm -hmm. And I I knew that, but it just, 
it was nice to hear it that she's she's healed mm-hmm. in, a, in an ultimate way mm-hmm. it was just a nice I can tell it was just complete complete love and he was just leveling with me and, and being a comfort so it was good perspective it wasn't something I didn't already know because I believed that mm-hmm. but it was nice to hear it mm-hmm. um, I think you said she, she don't have that cancer no more. He was more of a colorful guy, but yeah. That's right, that's right. So um, next, uh, community provides companionship and support in times of fear and anxiety. So my favorite example of this is, is, is Lord of the Rings. If, you, if you've read it, if you've seen the movies, I mean, when you think of like, <laughs> you know, um, Persevering friendship. That's one of the greatest examples I think of in literature. Mm-hmm. So this is from a, a, an article um, by a guy, a guy named Joseph Kant. He wrote, he wrote a book about it, and um, he says it's no accident, of course, that Tolkien called the first book of his trilogy "The Fellowship of the Ring." Part of the immense attraction of the story is watching a contentious assemblage. Mm. Sometimes I think. Um, The church is a contentious assembly. (laughs) Uh, Put away their differences and fight alongside one another against each new threat and danger. Mm. And if you know the story, you have you have the dwarves and you have the elves, which don't you know usually get along Mm. working together. And you have men and elves, and you have all these different races um, cooperating. Um, But there's a scene where Frodo. is trying to sneak off at Crick Hollow. He, he's trying to sneak off to carry the ring on his own. And Mary catches him, and he says something like, Frodo says something like, Mary, I just don't think I could trust anyone. And this is Mary's answer. So he says, as he's another hobbit, it all depends on what you want. You can trust us to stick to you through thick and thin to the bitter end and you can trust us to keep any secret of yours closer than you keep it yourself but you cannot trust us to let you face trouble alone and go off without a word we are your friends Frodo anyway there it is we know most of what Gandalf has told you we know a good deal about the ring we are horribly afraid but we are coming with you or following you like hounds. Mm-hmm. Love that. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you know the story, the um, especially Sam, but the hobbits are are really faithful friends. And I think in that Tolkien is sort of holding up like an ideal, mm-hmm. and um, and it's a Christian ideal mm-hmm. that that's the kind of friends we should be with one another. To say, I'm afraid, but I will not leave you. I will not let you face this alone. And and I think we're like Frodo sometimes. And I don't know who I can trust. I'd rather just go and bear this. Um, but we need to be the kind of friends who say, we're sticking with you. So that's the that's the relational presence. That's the companionship which is similar, but it's also distinct from what we just talked about, the perspective. Anyone ever experienced just that, that um, the faithfulness of a friend in in the face of fear or difficulty, or the constancy of a friend, or just the the comforting presence of a friend staying, staying with you? Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever been that? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> good to both. Good, good. I I too have a good friend. I've known him probably close to thirty years, and we have been actually going to see him tonight and his wife. Uh, and he is a friend just like that. When I mm. think of that, um, he knows things about me that nobody else will know. And mm-hmm. guess what? He's not going to tell anybody. I know things about him that I won't tell. He is that guy, mm. um, and. Uh, we've had times in our lives where we've had to pursue the other because you're trying to sneak off. Like, no, 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 you come back. What's going on, man? What's going on? You know, yeah. and we can have great conversations and know that it stays right here. Pray for each other. And, and yeah, I uh, I totally get that. Totally get that. It's what wonderful. a blessing. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. I would think just anything that you face in life is is made less kind of 
imposing, less overwhelming. Yeah, I could think. call him up in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And he knew myself. Too. Yeah. At the tail end of the last um, sto- uh, yes. the last movie, where Samwise picks up Frodo and says, "Well, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you." Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he carries him in. Yeah. Yeah. I have friendship like that. Do you? Wow. Thirty-five years. Wow. So. When I hear that 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 exists, it always yeah. gives me just a so much hope because I think it's rare mm-hmm. these days. Very rare, very rare. But it's so valuable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Found that in my wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, what a blessing to have a, a spouse who is such a close mm-hmm. friend. Yeah. It's good to hear that. Yeah. I look at you and your wife, and it, it, it feels such a joy to hear mm. these words. Mm. <laughs> yeah, she's wonderful. <laughs> um, so, moving forward, we're we're continuing to look at how how community helps with fear and anxiety. So, um, this is kind of similar. Um, but it's a combination of both and maybe a bit further. So community provides comfort and relational presence in times of fear and anxiety. Similar to what we've discussed already, um, but just maybe a deepening of the concept. So this is C.S. Lewis wrote a a letter to his friend. His brother was admitted to this hospital for at the time they were treating the alcoholism. It was kind of like a mental um, hospital, but trying to treat severe alcoholism and he's writing to his friend about it um, and his friend has written him a letter and this is what C.S. Lewis writes back thanks for your most kind and comforting letter like the touch of a friend's hand in a dark place for it is much darker than I feared don't imagine I doubt for a moment that what God sends us must be sent in love and will be will all be for the best if we have the grace to use it. So my mind doesn't waver on this point. My feelings sometimes do. Mm. That's why it does me good to hear what I believe repeated in your voice. It being the rule of the universe that others can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves and that one can paddle every canoe except one's own. That is why Christ's suffering for us is not a mere theological dodge, but the supreme case of the law that governs the whole world. And when they mocked him by saying, he saved others himself he cannot save, they were really uttering, little as they knew it, the ultimate law of the spiritual world. That just struck me as really profound. Uh, again, it, it pushes back against this idea that we can be self-reliant, that whatever we need, we can take care of ourselves. We can do for ourselves. We can comfort ourselves. We can strengthen ourselves. We can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Even that phrase is meant to be kind of mocking the fact that no one can do that, that you need someone else to lift you. Um, and so. I think Lewis always has a good way of saying things that makes me think more deeply about them. Mm. But what do you think? Because he's calling it the ultimate law of the spiritual world. The law that governs the whole world is that you can paddle everyone's canoe except your own. Mm. That others can do for you what you can't do for yourself. What do you think about that? You don't have to agree. This is not God's word. This is just Lewis. Um, He's using Christ on the cross when people said, oh, he saved other people, why can't he save himself? And we know he could could have saved himself. That's not the point. But the point is, um, it it was a demonstration of him doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And, and Lewis is saying that's also the case amongst, amongst believers, that we can do for each other what we cannot do for ourselves. I mean, to me, that speaks powerfully to facing fear in community. 
<laughs> but we, our culture teaches us to say things like toughen up, you know, um, <laughs> be strong, you know, um, don't be weak, fear is weakness, um, which is really a, um, it's kind of a doomed project, but the idea is you're supposed to be able to strengthen yourself. Mm. Any thoughts on that? It's okay if not, we'll move we'll on. I've had times in, in the evening before I go to community group uh, where I just think, oh, I don't want to go tonight. <laughs> I'm feeling down, I'm too tired, I'm blah, 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 you know. And I get there and I totally forget the focus on me mm. and I come back refreshed. It's not like I got a nap or anything, <laughs> but I've changed my focus. The group has changed my focus. Interesting. And it really, really does make a difference. We need one another mm -hmm. just to keep our focus right. Otherwise we get too immersed in self. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I, that You're already answering the question, um, just how have you been comforted by other believers in times of fear or worry? Mm -hmm. Even that even that stress of, I don't have the energy to go and engage with people tonight, mm -hmm. has been comforted mm -hmm. by that communal presence. Yeah, I think I, I can relate, Marie. I think I, I, live, I live in a very um, Richard centric universe my name is richard so I'm, I'm the center of the universe everything else revolves around me and uh, but being in community it's harder to think that way so it's a blessing it is it's a it's a huge weight to carry to be the center of the universe actually <laughs> perfection just doesn't come does it everything that everyone does is all about you <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll have time to share more. So we're going to go till about two twenty, and then we'll go back into the room. Jay's just going to say a benediction, and we'll. So um, I definitely want to give you a chance to speak up, but I do want to spend just a few minutes of talking about what are the obstacles that stand in the way, right? If this is such a good idea, if it's what God wants for us, if it reflects the glory and unity of the Trinity, why don't we do it? And you, we are doing it today, but why don't people do it more? Why is it difficult? And so there's a whole host of reasons. I just list a few here. And I want to talk about them, you know, if, if they make sense, what they are, how to overcome them. So the first one is, I say past traumatic. That's just because I, I work in the field of mental health, so we use that term trauma a lot. Um, there are different levels of trauma, so I'm not trying to be dramatic. There, there, are, there are traumas that are relative to the person. So to one person, something may be more traumatic to another person. Uh, we used to think of trauma as um, only referring to combat, you know, um, tra trauma from combat, which that would be an intense form of trauma. But traumatic experiences in community, and I'm thinking specifically of Christian community, and I hear this all the time in, in my office. I work with mostly people who identify, I'm a Christian believer, but many, many, many of them are not in community. And I ask them, why? Why are you not benefiting from you know what God has for you in community and it's um, this is probably the top answer I get because I've been hurt in the church and and sometimes by another um, congregant right by another person in the church sometimes by leadership there's this whole um, there's this whole category in mental health now called church hurt it's something that is prevalent and part of it, I think, is an, is an oversensitivity, you know, to being offended. So there's a little bit of a need for a, a little bit thicker skin sometimes. But there is real betrayal, you know, there, that happens in the church, you know, as, as hard as that is to admit. And um, there's also something called pastoral abuse. Sometimes that is um, a pastor um, saying things that are damaging to a person. Sometimes it is a pastor treating someone and a minister leader treating someone in a way that doesn't reflect God, but is actually, um, yeah, just cruel and devaluing. So, um, and that, you can imagine how that act carries a little bit more weight when it's coming from a, a church leader. It's almost as if they stand in, in the, you know, representative of God doing that. It, it wounds on a deeper level. And it, it, does, it does lead to a kind of hesitation to put yourself back into that um, back into the vulnerable position of connecting in a place where you can be hurt. 
So have, you, have any of you ever heard someone talk about being hurt in the church and avoiding it because of that, or being hurt by a church leader, or, or experiencing something that's made them wary of, of going into Christian community? Mm-hmm. Our family has that. Yeah, it happened to me. Really? Okay. And so you've I, experienced I'm not it. I can explain the situation, but my reaction to it was I'm never going to church again. See? There it is. And two months later, I realized I couldn't stand not being in the church anymore, so okay. I had to find another one. You know, I needed the family. Mm-hmm. But my reaction was I'm never going again. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks for your honesty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately, if you stay, if you, go, if you attend church long enough, it's gonna you're gonna experience something sure. that's gonna do that. Yes, you know, pick at that, and uh, you go to church in spite of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, the church is full of fallen, mm-hmm. broken people. Mm-hmm. So try being in any family and not being hurt. Mm-hmm. Try being in a body of believers and not being hurt. You wait long enough, it'll happen. Mm-hmm. It'll happen. And it happens everywhere. It happens at work. It mm-hmm. happens That's right. everywhere. But That's you right. have to go back to work. Mm-hmm. You, you know? do. But we feel like we're free not to go back to church so we don't work at it. Right. I think, right. I think that's where the big difference is. But when it comes down to it, which, you know, is really more important? Oh, certainly. Yeah. It's, it's yes. Our, our family of God is even more important than your job, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your job is important, but... Mm-hmm. Um, I think you're going to say something, Chris. Yeah, just that our family experienced that. When oh, really? My childhood family experienced okay. that. And the pastor was uh, teaching heresy. Mm, okay. And so if you read the scriptures, it says you call out heresy yeah. if it's being taught. And my dad actually did. He went and called out the heresy to first to the path, walked right up the line. First to the pastor, then to the elders, then to the regional guy then to the national and lost at all levels okay and was rejected and marked as a family of problems Mm -hmm. and our family was treated with extreme contempt but when my dad when my sister went on a retreat and she was publicly humiliated Mm -hmm. by that pastor he um Dad said, we're done. And my parents never went back to church. My sister has never gone back to church, etc. cetera. Mm. But um, God never forgot it because it was, this was way in the uh, mid-60s that it happened. In 2003, God put did what I call our miracle moment, which was God put me in the path of someone who knew the whole story and it came out and that dad had been absolutely correct in what the steps he had taken. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely firm that that's what had happened. I bumped into somebody who also had known it and known it for 40 years. And I didn't, I think God did that to help my parents heal because it was then another seven or eight years and they really turned back to the Lord in a big way okay. right before the end of their lives. Okay. So uh, in their 80s and um, you know, I don't know what all that was. I know what dad did what he felt he needed to do, you know, but it was a big hurt yeah. and it hard to hard to work through. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah. In it's that case, shocking. God decided to work to vindicate the yeah. situation, and I'm so thankful for that. I know that that's not always what happens, and even in a case like that where there's false teaching mm-hmm. being presented, mm-hmm. I think that would be an appropriate time to either you know to confront, but then maybe even to to leave that church. Well, and we did eventually. But yeah. when he was trying to do what he felt like the scriptures, he was following what he felt the scriptures had um, yeah, good, good. Uh, called each one of us as Christians to do. Yes. So. Amen. Do you have a comment? Yeah. Oh, I'm just thinking the, the humor of that uh, parody that you did on the counseling session. When you think of it, though, each one of those individuals made a sacrifice to attend. Yeah. Session. Right. As difficult as it, the human brought it up to be. Yeah, that's good point. Yeah. So I was involved in a church situation that resulted in a church split because of 
uh, the elders or the leaders of the church calling for the pastor to step down. They felt he was too involved in the community. He wasn't, you know, oh doing gosh. things for the church as much and whatnot. And, and so they wanted him to step down. Um, and of course, you know, I really saw the incongruency of that. Um, and, um, and so the church split. Not only did the church split, but it decimated the church. The church folded. Mm-hmm. Wow. The church absolutely flo- folded. And I was like, wow, Satan totally destroyed that church. Mm-hmm. When we in situations can't find a way to get, work through it. There's a handful of sitcoms on TV and that families will be fighting tooth and nail. But at the end, they find a way to say, you're important to me, I care about you, I love you, and let's resolve this. And they resolve it, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's unfortunate that in our Christian community, we can't find that way to say, okay, we disagree, or we've had a disagreement, we've had a misunderstanding, there's been a wrong to somebody, I'm sorry, forgive me. The reason that we're both passionate about this is because we care so much about this or about you or about us or whatever about our church. Right. But let's don't let that destroy our community. Mm-hmm. Right. And see that as a higher as a higher goal to say, I'm sorry, forgive me. I mean, forgiveness is a pillar of our faith. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it just it blew me away that that whole church, it's gone now. You don't they're both so the pastor left and started his church that church is gone and the ones that stayed that church folded Mm -hmm. it's not even around anymore I'm like wow really it's a shame it if we opened the floor I think we'd all have multiple stories like that to tell Mm -hmm. and and churches being torn apart yeah so when I think about the antidote to this obstacle the way to overcome it um it it might sound simplistic but I think um, humility is a big part of the solution. Um, humility is that virtue that helps us to um, to come to someone to to either repent or to give forgiveness, right? to give grace. Um, there's a there's a sense of pride that I think is at work when um, when wounds can't be healed in the way that that God teaches us. Um, forgive one another as Christ as God through Christ forgave you mm-hmm. that is the standard and so why don't we do that it's because we're prideful mm-hmm. usually so that yeah Chris I just wanted to add that I think uh, so that pastor after a period of time left and the next person to step into the pastoral role, role reached out to my parents for 10 years years asking them to well and unfortunately the way he did it then was the problem because he said repent and return Mm -hmm. and made a phone call would you come and repent and return okay so then that was putting the fault on them Um, and there was a space of where I think they needed to do that too Mm -hmm. but I maybe a simpler step of could we have coffee would have been better received and so I think they were trying they just could never mm-hmm. get there which was so sad yeah because it was really and like Kaz's experience the church no longer exists yeah so yeah that is not God's heart for us it's mm-hmm. not his will for us mm-hmm. So I think if there's if there's a humility in each of us, then there's a maybe a willingness to have that kind of tact and that really thoughtfulness. And how do we mend this? You know, how do we seek reconciliation? How do we restore the fellowship? Every fellowship gets broken. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the the fellowships that endure are the ones that can restore fellowship. Yeah. Right. So Marie, did you? Um, when you have a relationship, just a one person and another person, and you have the humility aspect in one and not in the other, mm-hmm. there's no way you can force a, res- a restoration until God works in the heart of the other. So the person who wants the restoration has to sit back and wait and pray. Yeah. And that's the challenge, waiting and praying, without sticking your foot in 
in your mouth and saying something that creates greater hurt and it goes on and on and on. Right. But that is one of the hardest things is sitting back and waiting for God's timing. It really is. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. <clears throat> Relational um, restoration takes um, certainly a work of God, but it does take multiple parties' involvement. Mm -hmm. And so we trust God for that. But the overarching theme I want for us is to prioritize community enough that we do um, we do enter into community even with the wounds that are um, inflicted there. Um, by the grace of God, we become more gracious people, we become more loving people, um, but even in the midst of um, conflict, even in the even in with the existence of tension and hurt, we continue to pursue community, and we we trust God enough to. Um, Marie, you you were very vulnerable when you said, "I just said never again," mm -hmm. and then God God gently brought you back mm -hmm. into the into His family. I like the phrase "as I could bear it." <laughs> okay, you know, because yeah. I needed healing, and He worked with that. And yes. Yeah. Yes, he's very he's very kind. I'm just going to survey these other ones just because um, we don't have a lot of time for each one. But social anxiety, fear of rejection. Anyone ever feel those things? Mm -hmm. Those are things that get stirred up when you go to church. Mm -hmm. You know, um, will I be accepted? Will I fit in? Will I belong? Will people like me? Will people want to be friends with me? Will people want to talk to me? Add a layer of that during COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are they gonna? Are Social they gonna, anxiety. They're gonna wear their mask. <laughs> are they gonna wear their mask? Are they? Are they gonna give me the disease? Are they gonna disrespect me? Right? Are they gonna disagree with me? Are they, are they gonna, gonna judge me? me? Yeah. All oh, that of mine is. Can I remember all those new names? <laughs> can you remember the name? What if you forget the name? Will they forgive you? <laughs> yeah. After the third time of asking, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> so all of that is. It is difficult. There's no getting around it. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Um, so I think to overcome that is just to recognize that it's real. And through experience, you know, be persistent in forming those relationships, in entering into corporate worship, in making it a commitment to come back and to come back and to come back and to participate and, and to engage and to trust God in that. Uh, the next one, lack of commitment. I find this a lot that... Um, my clients will um, get really excited about something and then go and do it, but then it will fall off over time. And I, I think I can see that in my own heart. There's a loss of momentum. There's, you know, this has lost the initial kind of energy, that the spark that it had. I'm just kind of like, eh, I don't really want to go, you know, or I'm, I'm less interested. I'll go back maybe in a couple weeks, mm -hmm. in a couple months, mm -hmm. on a holiday, never. Mm -hmm. So commitment is that is that structure that you you devote yourself to in advance. So you say, I'm going to go gather with the body of Christ um, every week, multiple times a week. And then the decision is already made for you in advance. Uh, and of course, there are exceptions, right? When something comes up, it's, there's no condemnation for that. But, um, you know, Eileen and I had to decide if we were going to have friendships, we had to put in place like, some like standing kind of like appointments with friends and then um that might sound kind of strange to schedule schedule things for friendship but like we knew the friendships were not going to develop otherwise so having something that was like it was going to happen every week or every you know it's like that helped friendships and community develop it, it's just like in marriage you commit to that person when you at your weddings, you don't have to commit to them every day. I mean, you can recommit, but it's already the decision's already made. Now you just now you just honor it. <laughs> so commitment commitment is important for community. Fear of condemnation. Um, now maybe we talked about earlier. Maybe there is a place for loving reproach, right? For 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 a timely, um, gentle rebuke. But people fear um, being called out for their sometimes sinful behavior. Mm -hmm. I think there's a tactful way to do that. Christ certainly showed a good example, right, of how to love sinful people. Um, but there's a fear that the church is going to be so, so harsh against any form of um, 
unacceptableness. Mm -hmm. And it may not even have to do this, and it may just be like, you don't look like us, or you don't, um, you don't walk the way we walk, you don't talk the way we talk. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a fear of not being allowed in. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, there, there is a right fear that I'm not going to be able to continue in my sinful behavior mm -hmm. by existing in community. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that is an example of fear that um, it's there for a good reason, because if you're in community, that sinful behavior is going to be more difficult to continue. Mm -hmm. So um, that fear is there because you have something wrong in your life. Mm -hmm. But more often I just see that people are going to be really... Um, this is the message I think in the media that you see of Christianity, that it's going to be kind of looking down upon you, mm -hmm. kind of holier than thou mm. attitude and that's not really what I find in our church mm -hmm. but that's the perception so the perception can, is enough to keep people away it doesn't have to be the reality mm -hmm. so I try to whenever I meet someone who thinks this about Christians I try to show them otherwise mm -hmm. um, not not a it, it's not a, a diminishing the concept of sin but it's just um, a lovingness towards the person um, it's a simple statement, but, but loving loving the sinner and, and hating the sin, I try to demonstrate that, and I can. Um, difficulty trusting others, that's related. Um, some of us have been hurt, and so we, we kind of, it's hard not to apply that, to project that onto other people. I trusted this person, and they betrayed me. Now I know not to trust other people. It's as simple as that. So um, there is a courage it takes to overcome that. Um, there's a little bit of courage to say, I'm going to give, I'm going to give trust to these people. I'm going to take a risk. Every relationship involves risk. Yeah. So you can think of, uh, C.S. Lewis writes about this, the only way to be totally safe is to, to lock yourself up in a casket of your selfishness. Mm. Sounds ugly. But he says it's the same thing as damnation. So it's not, um, it's not better. Um, so, so to take a risk, to take a risk to be in community. And not just to be there physically, although that has a lot of value, but to engage, um, to open yourself up in different ways. We have community groups. Um, we have members who are very loving here and, and who care about one another. So, so talking to people. You know, sharing with people, um, participating in ministry together, serving one another. Um, so we have an individualistic society, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> and, and it's been that way for a little while. Um, the Canadian philosopher uh, Charles Taylor talks about the social imaginary. And that concept is basically just like, it's the way we experience our culture, it's our society, it's the air we breathe. It's all around us. Um, it's the water we swim in. Right? If you ask a fish, how is the water? Fish says, what's water? Mm. It's just, it's what you live in. And our social imaginary is all about the individual and how the individual feels inside. Mm. That is the ultimate value of our society. Whatever a person feels, that is the most important thing. And how dare you question that? And how you dare you impose something external upon them? Now, we don't agree with that as Christians, but that is the world we live in. And mm -hmm. some, in some way, we're all affected by it. Mm -hmm. So we are all, in some sense, expressive individuals. We do think of ourselves as, what are my dreams? What are my, you know, my plans for my life? How do I feel about this? Um, and it's, it's, it's something we've just sort of grown up in and absorbed. But it does work against the communal aspect of faith. That when we're supposed to think of ourselves as a collective, as a community, um, that, that, that rubs us the wrong way as far as my autonomous individuality. How I feel should be most important. Um, whereas other societies and in other eras of history, it's been more, the values of the society have been more based on what the what the city values, what the polis values, what the um, society wants from you. If you fulfill those roles, then you have honor. And then there was a society that um, valued um, economic 
so um, participation. So there was a few generations back, I think, there was this value on am I earning, am I earning enough money to feed my family? Am I am I doing what I need to do to earn a living? Right? Am I am I productive in the sense that I'm economically productive? And if so, I'm doing well. And it's it's transitioned now out of that to am I fulfilled as a person? Am I am I self actualized? Am I am I doing something that really brings me satisfaction? That's what we value now. So I just um, we're all kind of victim of that in some sense, but we. We also have to honor what God says, and it's just a challenge sometimes when God calls us into community. Busyness and hurry is a, oh, I constantly hear, I'm just too busy, I'm just too busy. Um, how can you slow down enough to talk to someone or listen to them? Right? If you always have to be somewhere, I've got to go, I've got to go, I don't have time. Right? Retirement helps a whole lot. <laughs> Reti- okay. <laughs> yeah, that, let's just, let's all retire and then we can. <laughs> I think we did that for a year, and nobody liked it that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fill it up. <laughs> anyway, we're, we're just about out of time. Um, I'll, I'll read this last part, and I want the conversation to continue, so um, so uh, I'll, be, I'll be available to talk to you after, and any time that I see you at church, let's talk to each other, let's think about these things. So fear and worry are meant to drive us into deeper fellowship with mm-hmm. the body of Christ. I believe that. I believe there, there are opportunities to come together, benefit from one another, to benefit from God through each other. Um, and this is a quote from Untangling Emotions. I just love the way this captures it. Uh, God does not expect or even want us to go it alone during our lives on this earth. He actually built us to need each other as well. He is enough, and yet he has chosen to use the fellowship we have with each other to encapsulate and reinforce his presence with us. I think that's well put. And I just have, what a blessing to be joined in the body of Christ. Together in him, we can face any fear. Um, And so Piper, this is John Piper in an article. um, He's quoting Romans 12, verse 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. So there's the the, um, diversity and the unity. He says, we're redeemed together, justified together, forgiven together, created anew together, every need met together, loved by God together, perfected together, living forever together. And all of this glorious unity created in Christ and for the glory of Christ. Oh, let us never trivialize the church. It costs God the life of his son to create this. And what you share with the person sitting near you in Christ is a life and an inheritance and a union so great and so profound that it surpasses the value of all other human relationships and all inheritances and can never end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's interesting to note that it, it was always in the early, early church and throughout the centuries, when you became a believer, you became part of a community. When you were baptized, you were baptized into a community. Um, it wasn't this private thing that you did and now you're good. It was, it was simultaneous. Coming into a community and becoming a disciple of Christ were simultaneous with each other. So they were coexistent. We've kind of gotten away with that from that just in the sense that we have a lot of choice. Pastor Jay was talking about this. Um, I could go to this church one day and a different church another day and a different, and then I could watch one online and then I could go to a different church. Um, so we're not as solidly grounded to our community as they were in prior centuries. But we should be engaged with each other in the, in the sense that we get to know each other, we help each other, um, we're committed to be together regularly. Okay, yeah, Kathy just reminding me. Um, and that, um, I'll leave it there, but thank you so much for your participation. Um, thank you for your additions and just being here, your presence. It's been a blessing to me. And we'll go back into the main room and Jay will, will close us in prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you.